people. There's a bunch of documents that came out in 2020, um, including this really great uh, overview from OECD, but also um, a, a document from, from uh, Paulson. Yes. Uh, we've got a request to record the session. Can we oh, yeah, press ahead. this really quickly? <clears throat> We're going to say allow and got it. Maybe again. Maybe she requested multiple times. I'm not sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. Things going? I think you should. Is it recording? Are you seeing? Yes. It's yes. Okay. okay. Sorry. Excellent. Yeah, no worries. Okay. So this comes from a report um, from TNC and Paulson Institute. And um, a lot of the data came from a project I was involved with called the Biodiversity Finance Initiative, which is a global project looking at biodiversity finance uh, currently in over 40 countries, but they're, they've got funding from the Global Environment Facility, hopefully to expand to 90 more countries. So we're talking about um, you know, a large percentage of the world's countries will go through this process to, to identify what their financial flows are, their financial needs, and then try to identify uh, financial plans to... Uh, to, to try to achieve uh, their conservation objectives that they um, are all about to update based on the global biodiversity framework. Everyone familiar with that? Yeah? Uh, the Con Convention on Biodiversity, right? So each country comes up with a National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plan, an NBSAP, which in some countries is a very meaningful document. In other countries, it's a, a dream, right? And so the idea is to... Uh, try to improve how these are written, how they're financed, that kind of thing. So that's what Biofin does. Anyway, so a lot of this data comes from, from that. Um, and the, the striking thing, of course, is this big blue uh, uh, part of the, of the pie chart, which is domestic budgets and tax policy. So you're talking about, you know, and, and again, where, where a lot of the funding also goes to nature is, this is a global estimate, so it's from developed countries. A lot of developed countries pay for nature from their budgets, but a lot of developing countries do too. When we looked at India, they were spending, I think it was between two and three billion dollars a year on nature, right? So, um, so although we try to be creative and do these innovative things, you can see like, for example, even ODA, um, official development assistance, is only seven billion out of 133 billion. So that, you know, and, and um, biodiversity offsets here, that's mostly US and, and uh, um, Australia, for example. Obviously, Colombia's also got a really good program now. Um, you know, natural infrastructure, um, this is also government, mostly government funding. So you're talking about three quarters or more of money going into biodiversity in nature comes from governments. Now, People, a lot of people in the, in the private investment side are saying, well, that's terrible. <laughs> it should come from the private sector. And, and yeah, it'd be great if the private sector invested more, but the question is, why aren't they now? You know, why, why haven't they in the past? It's because it's, it's hard. I mean, if you're trying to conserve trees, right, as Peter is saying, keeping them vertical, um, you, there are fewer options to generate revenue from that versus when they're, they're, they're lying on the ground or when they're processed for things. So... It's actually hard, and structurally, it's hard to do that. So part of what conservation finance is trying to do is convert the economic benefits of nature into financial benefits or revenue flows and things like that. So, um, so here's what we have. $133 billion or so a year is what's being spent. It's been estimated that what we need is something on the order of $400 billion to $700 billion a year, which is a lot more than what we have, right? But I mean, even just for the, the 30 by 30 expansion of protected areas, it's been estimated to be around 130 billion a year to, to do it well. So that's a, you know, again, that's like more than what we have here, right? Basically, or the same as what we have for all, everything. Um, but I want to then compare this to what we're spending on uh, harmful subsidies, fossil fuels, agriculture, fisheries. Um, so we're spending a lot of money on things that are harming nature. Um, and that's a problem too. And then compare that to what the rest of the G of GDP, this little sliver of green, is what, um, if we had all the money that we need um, to save nature, um, it's like 1% of global GDP. So what is all the rest of that money doing, right? How many businesses do you know are, are, are beneficial to nature? Not that many. Unfortunately, not much of what we do is beneficial. So the challenge is not just raising money, but it's, it's trying to 
make the whole rest of this less harmful to nature. That's, that's the challenge. And so, um, and, and it's been noted, of course, that half of the world's uh, GDP is dependent on nature, World Economic Forum. That's not, you know, a small NGO saying that's a World Economic Forum. So they've identified nature as, you know, top, some of the top risks to businesses as well, right? So here, here's the problem. We've got, you know, we know we need nature. It's the basis of our economy, basis of sustainable development, provides all these services, um, highly dependent on government, and we're just not getting it right in any way, shape, or form. Okay, so how do we define conservation finance? It's because it's gonna solve things. I'm not sure how that, oh, it's all gonna work. So we define it as mechanisms and strategies that generate, manage, and deploy financial resources and align incentives, we add that little piece in, to achieve nature conservation outcomes. So the goal is outcomes, um, mechanisms are generate, manage, deploy, and align incentives. And, um, and we've come up with these seven categories. These are, these are um, I'm gonna switch to uh, a microphone and walk around. Is that gonna work? Yeah, because I'm tired of standing behind a podium. Um, so these seven um, kind of categories, are, they're, they're overlapping, they're not perfect. They're, they're, they're just a way to start to think about uh, different finance mechanisms and solutions for, for nature. And again, we're gonna do a little tour of these here. Um, first one being return-based investments. So this is where the sort of private returns opportunities are. These are the categories here um, that we've identified. So this is everything from you know, microfinance to peer-to-peer, uh, you know, -peer. um, FinTech could be a part of that. Um, you have uh, angel investing, um, incubators, venture capital, private equity, debt. Um, this is where, where some of the debt conversion goes, but there's also other parts that are public, as we heard before. Um, and then um, various sustainable investment strategies, so uh, ESG, um, exclusion, things like that, and tapping into capital markets in different ways. So as I mentioned before, um, return-based investments um, require revenue streams. So here's where um, uh, there's you know, great opportunities for things like ecotourism. We're, we're, one of the projects that we're involved with is the Global Fund for Coral Reefs. This is a blended finance instrument working in uh, ultimately around 20 or so countries and the idea is to stop uh, the loss of coral reefs. And as you know, or you may know, coral reefs are under massive threat from climate change, ocean acidification, but also a lot of local drivers of, of degradation. And so the theory behind that, behind this, this uh, fund, is to identify what those dri local drivers of degradation are and see where you can make investments in the businesses that, are, that could potentially be reducing the harms. So, Waste water treatment investments. These are kind of low returns, often blended finance instruments. Um, ecotourism, where there's profit from the ecotourism operations that go back to conservation. Um, there's actually a really interesting um, approach to uh, a, like a public-private partnership in ecotourism that I'll I'll mention later. Um, but uh, and there's a private equity fund that's associated with the Global Fund for Coral Reefs that's seeking to make five to $40 million investments in reef positive businesses. So, and uh, as I mentioned before, it's a challenge to find these, these deals. Um, so far, they, they, they're looking at waste, they're looking at um, some sustainable aquaculture and um, uh, tourism, things like that. Those are the kind of deals that are made, um, that are being made. And um, yeah, and then uh, microfinance is also another area that, that is, uh, has a lot of potential because a lot of the um, needs are, are occurring at the very local level, you know, um, and uh, access to capital is a problem. A lot of communities don't have uh, ways to fund sustainable enterprises or convert, like, from a conventional agriculture to organic or something like that. So microfinance can play a really great role. We, we run an incubator. We had um, uh, WWF and Kiva uh, succeeded at uh, getting into the incubator this past year, so they've done a study to see how they could collaborate more systematically to uh, to, to merge microfinance and, and uh, um, conservation. So I think a lot um, is coming from that um, up ahead, so keep, keep posted. Um, Morova, so Althalia, you've probably heard of them, one of the, the you know, earliest funds that were doing 
you know, nature-based investing, blending carbon and um, sort of sustainable uh, ag and things like that. So they would do loans to, to the ag, and then they would get carbon credit kickers. The, the, the returns to that first fund was actually based on the carbon. It turned out um, the making loans to, for sustainable cocoa production, you can get your money back, but you're not going to make much money. You know, these, these are tough, again, you know, keeping, doing, doing good conservation doesn't generate really great returns. Um, but, uh, but they've done very well, and they've expanded, and they were bought by, by Morova, a big French uh, uh, finance company, and, and they've got other. Um... There's another group I want to mention is the uh, um, Coalition for Private Investment and Conservation. This is a, a group of uh, NGOs and businesses that, that look at how to bring private investment in. Um, they produced a really nice report in 2021. There's talk about an ongoing um, state of conservation finance report uh, globally. Um, and they looked at, uh, this is just one example from that report, you know, where, where they looked at, uh, here's data from 21 organizations. What are people investing in? Commodities, agriculture, timber, right? So these are activities that you can do sustainably that can also generate a revenue stream, and that's what people invest in. Very little other um, kind of, you know, uh, environmental markets, biodiversity, water is obviously great investment because it's becoming more and more scarce. But as we heard earlier, uh, it's challenging. There's uh, complexities associated with that. And look at poor little ecotourism, uh, 2% there. <laughs> um, anyway, um, moving on to the second one. Now, again, just if you have questions or want to share experience that you've had um, in any of these areas, please raise your hand and I'll stop talking because... Otherwise, you just have to hear me talk for so long. Time. Okay. Um, the next category, this is a really interesting one, is economic instruments. And um, this is really combining, in a way, the sort of revenue generation that the taxes and fees and stuff can, can produce, and also uh, aligning the incentives. Because the best, for, from my perspective, the best economic instrument not only generates money for, for, for like taxes, for government to, that could go back to conservation, but it also changes the behavior of businesses and individuals towards a more sustainable approach. So um, environmentally related taxes, um, they can be green taxes like taxes on pollution. Um, again, you want to uh, reduce the pollution so you tax the bad, but they could also um, be a kind of a, a user pays type tax. Uh, the gr great example is from Palau, in, uh, that you know, decided to set aside a huge area of, of their marine uh, economic, exclusive economic zone as a protected area. They've since sort of had to come back a bit and allow, allow fishing there, but they helped finance that by a $100 uh, airport tax, everyone coming into the country. And um, some of that went to state pension, but 30% uh, of that, um, so $30 out of every 100 went to environment $15 went to deal with uh, and make investments in wastewater treatment because there, there's, there's atoll islands and, you know, waste is a huge issue. And $15 went to the protected area network to help finance protected areas. So um, very interesting approach. Um, fees and charges, everyone's familiar with this. Entrance fees, these are, you know, the, the challenge there um, globally is, is that a lot of the fees that get charged for, benefit, you know, for nature, these are, again, user pays type approach. Um, end up uh, going to Treasury, uh, so central government, don't necessarily get spent or retained by the protected area managers, things like that. An um, example is uh, Botswana just recently changed it. They, they, had, they had had all the money go to Treasury, and the, you know, visiting your pro amazing protected areas there, the staff were just not interested in, they, they didn't see it as a service uh, situation. They didn't, they didn't see the visitors as clients in any way. When the money now is, is being retained by the protected air agency, all of a sudden you're aligning the incentives of the managers and, and the staff, realizing that if they do a better job, they get more money to do their work. And so um, it really, these, it seems like it's just a money thing, but it's a, a psychological thing too. Peter. You don't have to, the, the Miscellaneous Receipts Act of 1887 here in the United States creates a barrier, so I think we're trying to do a mitigation bank on the National Forest, but we're going to just play the case, right? So the water shed, the income from the cooperative agreement to use the land would have gone to the U.S. Treasury, not to land management purposes on the plants in the National Forest. There's some 
Yeah, and it's um, it's huge. So we, you know, when you when you set up a system like that, you need to you know think through all the steps of the you know, and it goes back to the beginning. You raise your money, generate it, but you also need to manage it and deploy it in ways that are effective. So, um, tradable resource permit use, you know, fish quotas are you know obviously a huge opportunity if they're science based. Fines and penalties, compensation offsets. I think you cover you've covered offsets a bit. Um, uh, again, um, oh, I just w will say one thing around that, or I'll get I'll get to it in the in the business uh, section. But there's a growth now in the concept of biodiversity credits or nature credits, and this is a could be transformative. It could be a complete disaster. We're trying to um, make sure it's transformative, um, but uh, I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and then environmentally motivated subsidies. Most subsidies. When you hear the word subsidy, you think that you know it's a danger, it's a risk. But you can have uh, positive subsidies. In fact, e easements, in a way, are, are, are positive subsidy for achieving certain behavior. Or yeah, or right. I mean, the whole the, the uh, right Inflation Reduction Act, right, it has a lot of those uh, incentives. So economic interests are huge and very very effective. Um, Grants and other transfers, this is where official development assistance is, um, you know, philanthropy, um, remittances, uh, this is uh, a lot of countries, workers travel overseas, they provide remittances back home to, to their, their families, there's, you know, ways to use that. And then conservation trust funds and environmental funds also fall into this because they're mostly grant-based instruments. And um, I just want to... Um, Stop here and just talk about uh, project finance for permanence. Did 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 you cover that at all? So um, this is a um, uh, an approach that we talked a little bit about. It's being expanded on in Canada. Um, the, there there's a, been a, I think about six of these done globally. Um, one of the most recent was uh, was Bhutan for Life, and the idea is that you raise a lot of money up front by multiple donors, and um, it's historically been focused around protected areas and you the government agrees to um, kind of take over responsibility for financing protected areas over time recognizing they can't necessarily do it right now so you raise Columbia raised I think I want to say 245 million dollars or something like that recently and half of which is actually coming from the government which is special um, through a gasoline tax and, um, and the idea is there's put all this money into a trust fund, spend it down in what's called a sinking fund over time, so that over the course of 20 to, to 30 years, you spend all that money down, which means you have a pretty good burn rate for that money. I mean, over that time, government figures out ways to fill the gap with other revenues, other resources, and so it, over time, government takes on more and more responsibility, but the upfront... Uh, investment comes from philanthropy, from bilateral donors, and a combination. And all that runs through a conservation trust fund, which is an independent, um, you know, well-governed, effectively a foundation at the national level. Sometimes they're multi-country, and um, sometimes they're sub-national, focusing on a set of protected areas. And they, they manage the money. They could use endowment funds. They can use these sinking funds that I mentioned. Um, usually it's a combination. They can also do get grants, you know, a lot of big donors have trouble giving small grants in developing countries, so, but the needs are small. You have a lot of local NGOs that need money, so these trust funds basically act as a filter, taking in these big grants and, and reissuing them as smaller grants to the NGOs and, and actors of the local level. So trust funds are um, a really uh, amazing structures and organizations, and there's about a there's over 100 of them globally, and there's a few coming in um, uh, now being established for project finance for permanence projects. And there's a, a, a gl global partnership with a lot of the environmental NGOs, TNC, WWF, called Enduring Earth. Um, and that is their goal is to, as I mentioned, there's only been like six of these. They want to create 20 by 2020, uh, 2030, sorry, 20, 20 in 10 years, basically. That was the plan. So um, very ambitious, and they're doing quite well. They've got Bezos involved and, and others. Uh, so, um, and, and the CFA um, has been um, providing support to trust funds for years. This is a 10-year review 
um, you can download from our site. We also produce uh, the best pr the practice guidance for trust funds as well. Okay, fourth category. Well, let me stop there again. Qu questions now? Great. Let's get your microphone. Go from the back. Thanks, Katie. Um, I'm really enjoying your presentation, and I really appreciate everything that CFA is doing. Uh, I'm Libby Kamala with World Wildlife Fund and Buffalo Nation's Grasslands Alliance. Um, I'm wondering if you can speak to any examples you've seen of conservation trust funds that are sending most of the money, where most of the recipients are working lands as opposed to protected areas. Something that I've been talking about with folks and trying to find examples of that since we hope to establish a fund um, through the Buffalo Nations Grasslands Alliance for 16 Native Nations in the Northern Great Plains, and it's, there's no strictly protected areas that we'd be working with. Great, thank you. Um, that sounds like a great project. And there's no, so the, there's no um, reason why a trust fund would be focused only on protected areas. It, it's, uh, it's just historically they've, they've been doing that. But you've had, there's trust funds, um, you know, in, uh, in Madagascar, one of the early ones um, was called Tani Meva, and uh, they're focused on community-based conservation, so no nece not necessarily a relationship to, to protected areas. So there's plenty of examples. Um, the Great Bear uh, Rainforest uh, had, a, you know, kind of a, a grant-based trust fund, but they also had an investment fund. So I would definitely encourage you to look at um, multiple structures that may, uh, where you don't necessarily do it all through a grant-making institution, but maybe some concessional finance as well, um, because then you can get money back and then you're, you're leveraging the money a bit better and, and uh, you can reuse the money multiple times. Um, trust funds themselves are also looking into, as foundations do with program-related investment, they're looking into using their, their capital to, to make investments as well, and so that's a huge opportunity a lot of the trust funds, there's only one that's been super successful at uh, impact investing, that's uh, Fondo Acción in Colombia, they, they're taking lead, but a lot of the trust funds are, uh, want to do this kind of uh, investment. Again, it's hyper-efficient compared to giving grants. You, you, get a zero, you get a negative return with your grant. If you can make a, 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 a aligned concessional loan, at least you get your money back, right? So, so that's a very strong interest of trust funds to explore these things. So. Um, I hope that was a good answer. Other, other questions around trust funds or anything? Okay, I'm going to keep going then. All right, business and markets. This, this category, uh, of course, business interacts in many ways with a lot of the other categories. So this is a kind of voluntary business category, let's say. Um, so supply chain resilience, I think more and more businesses recognize how Managing nature effectively is essential for their supply chains. Everything from you know your basic commodities through water. You know, there's been a lot of investment in water, um, and, and uh, um, in uh, watershed management for like you know beer business. You know, what are you selling? You're selling water, basically. Coca-Cola, Nestle. They all recognize the importance of this. Um, conservation businesses um, can be defined as businesses that that through their, their actual business model, contribute to conservation. So a whole range of opportunities there. Um, corporate social responsibility and sustainability. Historically, corporate social responsibility has been um, philanthropic, you know, giving, um, deciding a, a topic that they're interested in, giving money. But more and more, um, it's being integrated into their uh, business models, recognizing, again, the need to um, assure uh, price stability and uh, a license to operate, things like that. And then finally, voluntary offsets. We, we heard um, earlier a bit about the challenges that carbon offsets are facing. Um, and so to that challenge, we're going to add biodiversity offsets. So the, the I actually think that the, um, the challenge of the carbon offsets, one of the problems I found with carbon offsets is that it doesn't reward areas that are really well managed, where you've minimized your... your uh, Threat. So to, to show additionality in a carbon offset, you need to show that there's an active threat. You need to be able to quantify that threat so that you can show well, change over baseline. Um, and part of why, why Vera and, and the, the whole market's been under threat is because 
those are very hypothetical and it's really hard to prove that that change would have occurred and um, so, um, so we're trying to develop a biodiversity uh, credits basically that, um, that don't have the same, uh, that, that are rigorous, that uh, are scientific, have scientific integrity, but um, you know, don't require that same level of additionality because our, the conservation goals that we have are to maintain areas that are intact and have high biodiversity value. And if you're only going to invest in areas that are showing you know, obvious threat and destruction, those areas are not likely to survive that threat necessarily. And of course, then you add climate change on top of it. So you know, the areas that are much more likely to survive are those vast areas that are interconnected that are, you know, um, and so we're trying to figure this out. There's uh, World Economic Forum is running a bunch of uh, uh, working groups on this. Uh, there's a group that's being led by uh, United Nations Development Program called the Biodiversity Credit Alliance. They're working on this. Um, we're, the CFA is part of a group with, uh, um, with VERA, the, the standard setting body, and other actors like Conservation International. We're trying to develop a framework and a, and a set of standards. So a um, lot of action, a lot of excitement around this right now. Where it's going to go, um, hopefully someplace good, <laughs> um, but uh, and then this little graphic at the bottom is, is, is to show um, a collaboration between uh, a, a fintech, uh, like an online banking uh, organization in um, Philippines, with um, with the Philippines uh, Biodiversity Finance Initiative, and they, they it's a basically every time you do a transaction on on your your banking on your phone, small percentage goes to plant a tree, and so they've they've raised over five hundred thousand dollars. Um, just with this, uh, you know, mobile finance app that's just online banking, basically. So it just goes to show, you know, small um, marketing benefits can, can result in some money. And um, I know it's not a whole lot of money, but it's planted a lot of trees in the Philippines, which desperately needs it. So, um, And then um, sort of associated with this is you're all familiar with nature-based solutions. And I just wanted to just highlight that, um, you know, Investing in, in nature as a green infrastructure solution is so much more efficient than building gray infrastructure, and I, don't, I won't go on there. Um, public financial management. This is the most uh, boring part of it, uh, of conservation finance, but it's, as I mentioned before in that graphic, it's, this is the biggest source of funding, and there's so many... Um, challenges in getting that public money. We, we heard from Quantified Ventures earlier today, right, how even though you've got money allocated for uh, certain nature conservation projects, the flow doesn't always work, the timing's wrong, and so, you know, and for globally, um, if you, oftentimes the ministries of environment and the, the protected area agencies are not the most efficient, let's say, and so they don't do budgeting on time. They don't, you know, have very clear um, uh, results that they can identify and convince the ministries of finance. And therefore, they don't get their money on time. They don't get the, the same budgets. Um, and so this is a huge, huge area that, that needs attention and improvement. And as I say, it, it, many people think it's boring. So do I. But it's really important. And um, a lot of people are working on it. Fiscal transfers are, are another fascinating mechanism which, uh, where a government, national government, uh, creates quantified uh, targets at, for the state level. And if the states achieve that, uh, that target, they receive uh, more national funding. So it's a way for national governments to incentivize states, in, which in many countries, like uh, Malaysia, for example, are primarily responsible for the natural resource management. And so, you know, how do you, you know, when you when you give the states the the um, authority to manage that those resources, they're going to exploit um, because that's how they generate revenue. So, so this is a way for the national government to incentivize more conservation activities. It's called ecological fiscal transfer, um, government grants, um, reforming harmful subsidies, and then earmarking financing for nature. As I mentioned before, it's such a huge, huge piece. Um, Another side note is the, the International Monetary Fund um, and I, I, probably the World Bank in general discourage countries from earmarking funds. Their, their philosophy, I'd love to get some 
thoughts on this, but their, their philosophy is that all the money should go to central treasury and that individualized funds for t specific uh, purposes should be dissolved. A lot of countries have done this. And, um, and then the government can then plan best how to use the funding, right? That's the, the theory behind it. Theoretically, it's great, but environment always gets left behind because there's no one advocating for it. Education, sure. Healthcare, sure. These are, you know, humans advocate for that, but the trees are incredibly silent and they, they're not good in these political situations. And so, um, so having, you know, earmarked revenues, especially when they come from nature, you know, should be earmarked for nature. And if anyone's here from the IMF, um, let's have a discussion about this, okay? You need to change your, your attitude. Okay. Um, there's only two more here, and then I'll, and then I'll stop. But risk management, um, fascinating area. One of the um, benefits that nature provides to, to people is, is risk mitigation. Whereas, but it's really hard to capture that finan the financial flow from risk mitigation. When the big storm hits and you lose billions of dollars of, of infrastructure, um, mangroves protect it, coral reefs protect it, but you don't see the numbers until you, you, you have the damage and maybe you've minimized, you've decreased the risk, decreased the damage, but then how do you monetize that? So there's some interesting products, insurance especially, um, and the insurance industry and the reinsurance industry are getting really into this. There's um, a product called uh, parametric reef insurance that's been used. Um, it allows instant payouts, basically, when uh, the storm winds are above a certain amount. Um, money is able to be spent immediately to restore coral, build the, bring the, the, the big uh, you know, coral uh, heads, glue them back up, things like that, and that's been shown to have a huge impact. Um, and, uh, and then there's also explore, exploration right now, um, many areas of, of the premiums around insurance and how um, if you invest in, let's say, a fire, reduction of fire risk around your house, things like that, you can actually reduce your premiums. And to me, this is, there's an explosion of opportunity there globally, and we're only just scratching the surface. Um, pay for success, we heard about that from Quantified Ventures. Fascinating. I got a picture of the rhino bond here that breaks new ground in conservation finance. Um, just as a, as a footnote, you were involved in the conservation in the, in the rhino bond, so nothing personal. But the um, if the if the rhino bond succeeds, the the investors get paid off. If the, if the rhinos, are, but the the organization that's actually managing it, there's no incentive for them to either succeed or fail. Um, they they get paid I think 10 million. You know, it's, and in fact, so effectively, it's just like a grant. Um, but the investors get paid, um, and so they're they're pretty happy about it. Um, but there's great, great opportunity here to take the enthusiasm, let's say, around the rhino bond and use it for other uh, species and other activities. And, and then blended finance. Um, is everyone familiar with what blended finance is? D yeah? Did, did, did you cover that at all? And, and yeah, okay, so I'm not going to cover it. But the, um, uh, I mentioned before the Global Fund for Coral Reefs is a blended finance instrument. Um, again, blended finance is uh, necessary from what we're seeing um, with regard to conservation enterprises and things like that. And so huge opportunities for both the private sector to benefit, finding all the right investors. So finally, financial efficiency, uh, management effectiveness. Why, why is that a finance mechanism? Well, because if you don't have to spend uh, money, if you could be more effective and efficient with your use of funds, then there's less money to raise. And so you're saving money, and there's all kinds of effectiveness. One of the um, examples are public-private partnerships here. Um, uh, you've probably heard of African parks, yeah? Um, so there's a, um, you know, governments are happy to, to outsource the park management to African parks because they, they can bring in the resources, they manage it efficiently. The government itself could not manage it that efficiently, don't have the resources up front. And, um, and so uh, this is, a, again, it could be a great cost saving for the, for the country. And um, they're, they're doing quite well. I'm not sure how many parks they manage, but, but quite a lot. Um, integrated accounting, I, I, I've, I've included here, this is natural capital accounting. You've all heard that term before, you know, trying to use the uh, 
economic value or the quantifying nature as part of national systems of accounts. We're all focused on global uh, uh, GDP, you know, as a measure of our success. This is a limiting, very limited uh, type of measure. So try to bring nature in is more important. Um, and then finally, mainstreaming biodiversity and development. Um, a terrible term, mainstreaming biodiversity. But really what this is, is, is about a whole of government approach. And actually, this is probably one of the most significant things that countries can do is um, get everyone talking with each other. So the Ministry of Agriculture talks to the Ministry of Finance and talks to the Ministry of Environment. Everyone together comes up with a plan because otherwise you basically have situations like in the Philippines where the Ministry of, uh, of Agriculture had this big um, funding for reforestation, um, but the biodiversity department had nothing to do with it. So they were planting all these fast-growing, ultimately invasive trees over vast areas when they could have used that money to plant native trees and to rebuild ecosystems. And all it took was, was them talking with each other. So you know, we, we highlighted this, this opportunity in our, in our biodiversity finance initiative. We saw this big chunk of money going to reforestation, but done poorly. And now I think at least 30% of the money that's being spent on reforestation is all being spent on, on native trees. So not 100% success, but, uh, but a huge uh, amount of, of funding now going to uh, restoration. So anyway, that was a ridiculously long tour of, of mechanisms and, and what's going on out there. But I, I'll stop there, and hopefully you'll have some examples or questions from your experiences. Thanks. After lunch, everyone's asleep. <laughs> Thoughts, questions? Yeah. Hi, Jen Oki Farley from Department of Navy, and I'm actually not even sure how to ask this question, but I've been asked by my bosses and bosses' boss several times now to look into reef insurance and how we might, as a public agency, uh, take advantage of some kind of structure like that because we we administer uh, on behalf of the public um, a lot of acres of, uh, of um, marine environment, especially like out in Hawaii and Guam and the Marianas. And I was just wondering if you have any, uh, for the extreme layperson, like how that could work and have you ever had any experience with a public agency getting reef insurance and, and, and how that works? Thanks. Sure, great um, question. So um, the biggest reef insurance program right now is, is being run out of the Mesoamerican Reef Fund, so a conservation trust fund, and um, they, they, um, they basically are paying the premiums. So basically the way the param that parametric reef insurance works is that you set the, the amount of money that you want as the payout, and then you, together with the in this case, Willis Towers Watson, the sort of uh, the industry analyst or whatever, they, they figure out um, the likelihood of certain wind speeds occurring and the damage that those wind speeds could do. And uh, you basically set, um, you set up a, a personalized insurance product, and depending on what you, you know, how much money you need to restore the reefs when they get destroyed or, or, or damaged, and your level of sort of risk tolerance. Now, you could... You could avoid the whole insurance piece and just pay for it yourself, but this way um, you're 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 spreading the benefit um, and uh, spreading the risk basically and using the, the insurance uh, industry for what for what they do. Which is yeah, a our challenge with the you know pay as it happens is we are not a fast moving animal, <laughs> and so we have to you know if something happens even if it's something like a ship grounding so it's it may not be climate change or uh, wind speeds or typhoons is a big one we just had a big one in Guam but let's say it's a ship grounding maybe not anything to do with us but it's submerged land that we manage and we don't have a good mechanism to respond immediately and then you kind of lose your opportunity because then coral reef turns into rubble and it just moves around it damages the reef even more so it we that's what we're struggling with is what is another tool we could potentially use that would allow us that um, 
the flexibility to uh, respond immediately. Yeah. I think reef insurance is a great idea, and um, I'm happy to put you in touch with the people at Willis Towers Watson that, that do that. Yeah. Yeah. It's perfect for that situation. Sorry. Hi, I'm Jennifer Dill with the Pew Charitable Trusts, and um, we're part of Enduring Earth, and we're looking at all these different exciting opportunities um, globally and really struggling with, you know, what are the best options for us in the conservation trust fund sphere? Um, and was curious if you had thoughts on kind of if it's better to leverage existing um, entities out there or, or structure bespoke ones for individual deals. Right. Um, what a great question coming from Enduring Earth because in many cases you're creating new ones for these um, and uh, no, I, I'm a big fan of using existing institutions where, where possible and strengthening them. And, and, and um, any, any institution, whether it's a business or, or a nonprofit or, or a, a trust fund, has a risk of failure, you know, have governance issues. So, you know, I, I um, strongly encourage building on existing um, institutions where possible because they've shown that they haven't failed over the last few years or they have governance to, to build on. So, um, but, um, you know, your, the goals may be different and, and these trust funds are built around a mission statement and where the mission statement that that trust fund has, it's built into their charter. And so where, they, where that's not adaptable, you would have to create something different, you know, so, but otherwise I would highly recommend going with existing ones. Yeah, but there's, it turns out there's not a lot of specialists on trust funds globally. The demand for, for them is high. So, great career opportunity. Yeah. Other thoughts? Questions? Yeah, sure. <laughs> That's a better one. Uh, I was just interested in that um, chart that uh, had 1% uh, where the World Economic Forum said that that was what we needed to protect nature? Or is that current spending on nature? Yeah, I mean, I, I can go back to that, you, but it's... Yeah, I was because I was... I mean, the 1% it, doesn't sound like a lot, and I was wondering whether that was linked to the 30% goal um, of protection of <laughs> land and sea, and then, you know, with the other 70%, what's happening with that? Um, because obviously, you know, you can, you can have a goal of 30% protection, which is great, um, but if you manage the other 70% poorly, that's not great. <laughs> so anyway, I was just, it was just an interesting slide. I, I, I yeah. didn't know what to make of it, yeah. No, the, the, um, so that, the, that 1% is the 1% of global GDP that experts say we need to invest in nature annually to, to, to achieve our goals. I question that. Um, that, that number, I think it's quite random. Um, and I think it's meaningless as well um, because, because of that 99%, you know, if, unless, and, and the, as well as the 30% target can also be considered meaningless in a way if we don't figure out the 70% because of connectivity, because of spillover, because of climate change. Ecosystems are migrating basically due to climate change. And so, um, you know, but however, having a target, having a quantified target like that has been really important for the first global biodiversity strategy where the only sort of two targets out of the 17 ACHI targets that were even closely achieved were the quantified uh, protected area coverage. 17% for land and 10% for, for ocean. Those were, you know, more or less achieved when a lot of the other 17 targets were not. And so I... I believe those target setting is important, but you're right, the 70% is also important, and we should be managing all of our ecosystem, you know, well, and that's where that 99% of the rest of the GDP is. How are, the way I look at it is that it, the way that businesses and the economy is run right now is not sustainable with regard to nature, right? And we know that we need to have... Um, this balance in the future to survive. Otherwise, we're going to lose our pollinators, lose our water, lose all this stuff. So this is the biggest opportunity ever for business, but no one's really realizing it. No one, you know, like the transformation that needs to occur, there's only two choices. One is we survive or we don't. 
If we survive, the amount of transformation and opportunities for business is enormous. Um, so that 70% uh, is huge. Um, yeah. way out and get maybe a little spiritual about this. When you say that we can't, um, I think you said earlier, we're not able to recognize, recognize the economic value because we, we can't monetize it or draw revenues from it. it. That seems to miss the point. I mean, at a really big level. So what? I mean, look outside, you know, the smoke and, and it's sort of really brought home this week to me the maybe disconnect between you know, one percent versus ten percent return and survival. Can you just talk a little bit, like, kind of your own personal philosophy or, or others' philosophies that mean something to you about sort of really what we're trying to do here uh, beyond make money? <laughs> yeah, I, no, I, I, I got this. I got this, um, and I got five minutes to answer. No, um, hopefully it'll be quicker. The um, yeah, the, the answer is that you, there is no answer, except that we are working within a system, right? And, and that system values um, numbers, it values finance, it values, um, uh, doesn't even value economic analyses enough, basically, but it, 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 it values um, making money above everything. And that's a system that we're in. And so, you know, um, we, although when you look at all of our economic analysis of nature is measured how? On its impact with people. But what about the other species out there, right? What about the, the moral or, you know, the moral value of, of maintaining nature for its own sake? And what right do we have as one species in this planet to alter the future of other species? So there's major moral issues there that I think in the end are gonna be the things that, that move people and change people. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm heartened, I don't know enough, I've, I've decided to read about it, but there's a movement towards uh, uh, the rights of nature, you know, um, and uh, I think there's, you know, huge opportunity there. If, if nature has standing in, in courts of law, I think that that's gonna transform uh, some of this. Um, but, uh, but, but the way I see the finance piece is that Within the system that we're in right now, um, having the numbers gets you a seat at the table. If you don't have the numbers, and I think what was a, um, from Quantified Ventures uh, was saying, you know, like it's you, you master the numbers. It's, it's a starting point, and it gets you. And I've seen it, it get us a seat at the table with the ministries of finance. The odd thing is that when we when we work with ministries of finance, and you say, look, nature's all these externalities, they say, yeah, we understand externalities. They're all economists. They get it. It's the ministries of environment that have no clue. And, and uh, so, so I, I think that, that um, these are great, great points and the transformation that we, that we need is so pervasive that it's going to have to touch all these issues of morality and spirituality. And, um, but you've got to get a seat at the table first. And, and the numbers really help, um, even if they're wrong. You know, just to have something, just to be able to talk the language of the people that are making those decisions, the, the, the CEOs, the, the ministers of finance. Yeah, that's challenging, though. Great. Anyone? In comparison to that question, this is going to seem really petty. But <laughs> so uh, on the subject of biodiversity credits, which I find very exciting and compelling and don't know much about, if um, additionality is not the right approach for all the reasons you said, it makes perfect sense, it's not the right mentality, can you speak to what direction they're going to try to quantify that? Is it trying to add, put a price on avoided loss of biodiversity? And if you could speak yeah. to that. So, so the, all these initiatives, for the most part, are, they're working on the additionality piece. So you're basically talking what they're calling uplift. So change from business as usual to increase the divert, you know, the abundance of, or you know, decrease the risk. So so a change above baseline, uplift or avoided loss. Both of those are additionality based. This is the main work that's been going on right now with all these different groups. So methodology, uh, Plan Vivo has got a methodology that's out there. It's avoided loss basically, or it's uh, it's uplift but it also works for avoided loss. So I'm not saying additionality is not, um, 
uh, useful. It's going to be part of it. Um, but I'm just saying that in addition to that, we need a, a kind of an additionality that's, that's less um, about the, 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 that's more maintenance, it's a terrible world word, but uh, you know, achieving sustainable conservation in the long run and based on the long-term objectives of maintaining intact ecosystems and maintaining connectivity, that it's not dependent. The, the best example is um, you know, some of the indigenous peoples in, in deeply forested areas have been managing these areas for years. And you could say, well, there's no additionality. They're doing great. Well, and, and there's no threat. Yeah, until there's uh, gold found in that area, and then the threat becomes palatable and it's too late because you haven't strengthened the organization, you haven't provided them with a sustainable source of financing. And there's actually one other concept that, that's uh, interesting, which is the uh, ec ecological basic income. Uh, this is a, a new concept, but it's maybe related to these, to these credits where um, people are suggesting there's value in paying people who are living in or adjacent to protected areas a, a kind of basic income for, doing, for just keeping it under conservation, and it's very similar in a way to the credits, but, you, but for the credits or the certificates, you need to have quantified third-party verification, even if there's no additionality. You need, you need rigor, even if it's just, you know, satellite surveys, you know, and, and, and making sure that they're doing what they're saying they're doing. So, yeah, great, great questions. Thank you very much, David. I think we're, we're on to break.